And the winner is, you'll find out this week on Motoring 2004. TSN's Motoring 2004 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that. And now to the purpose of this whole show, our Car of the Year for 2003. Ladies and gentlemen, this was a scene on last year's Motoring Car of the Year special as Graham and friends selected a winner from our viewer email. The winner was Graham Jardine who selected the 2003 Mazda 6 as his overall car of the year as we did here on Motoring. So what did he win? Well, he won a chance to visit the biggest candy store in the automotive world. You see, each year the Automobile Journalists Association of Canada holds their annual test fest here at the Shannonville Racetrack, when they gather all the brand new cars and trucks. So today we're going to hang out with Graham as he meets some of the journalists and tries to get behind the wheel of as many cars as is humanly possible in one day. But first, let's find out why this event is so unique. <laughs> I think the two unique factors of it are that every manufacturer is represented and the number of journalists who participate in a team factor. So there's a, the cars are divided into categories and then the journalists into teams and they drive each category back to back, same condition, same day, same route, and then fill out a very complicated scorecard on that individual vehicle. So the summation is that you get a much more valid vote total, if you like. We figure there's roughly 300 cars here, 62 individual classes, if you like, or entries in classes, but each manufacturers bought multiple copies of each vehicle. Most of us drive 50 to 100 vehicles a year. I would say the vast majority of those here participating in this event, we do drive a vehicle every week, most weeks more than one. But here you get to do it back to back, the same, let's say two pickup trucks, you drive one on a given route and then you immediately switch into another one and drive it on the same route, same conditions. So you get to do a back to back comparison which is much more valid when you're trying to compare vehicles. All yours buddy. Super. <laughs> when I heard that I won I actually uh, had missed the show because it was on New Year's uh, over the holidays and it wasn't the usual schedule, I didn't think it would be on. And I had a, a cousin in Montreal who called me and uh, she said, oh you... Uh, you won something, didn't you? I said, well, yeah, I couldn't remember what I'd entered at that point. It was a couple of months earlier I'd sent in the entry. So I finally realized what it was, and uh, excitement grew from there. I remembered the, the picture of the board of keys, and I uh, couldn't wait to see it. What do you think of the STI? That's oh, amazing. It's Just feel a little bit of oversteer drift in the back end. It's good. Yeah, we'd... Just dodging the seagulls, that was the main thing. <laughs> Don't want to scoop any up. Well, for the past year, knowing that I was coming, I sort of kept a list of any of the cars that I'd read about, the new ones that were coming out, just hoping that uh, most of them or some of them would make it here. And then there was a list published in the paper, and my gosh, they were all there, so it was really great. The Viper, actually, what, why don't we go and do that now? Because he said, uh, not even we're allowed to drive the Viper. You get to go out for a ride in the Viper, and I spoke to the guy from Chrysler last night, and he'll do that for you right now. So why don't we go do that? All right. Feels like I've been watching Motoring Forever. It's a great show. I really enjoy the uh, the segments. I think uh, you got just the right mix of the Tess, uh, Gardner, and Kenzie. It's a great combination. I started with Car of the Year. We were trying to figure it sneaking up on 20 years ago, and I was one of that first group. We had 12 cars. We had A category. It was like new car, new vehicle. Then along came trucks and cars, then trucks and cars and SUVs. Now you've got trucks and cars and SUVs and crossovers, and you've got $15,000 cars and $150,000 cars. So it's just grown in huge amounts. Once in a lifetime chance, uh, all these cars and uh, you know, ones that you probably wouldn't ever get a chance to get behind the wheel of, uh, you just can't beat it. A lot of people are very envious of all you guys here, you know that. Eat your heart out. <laughs>
True or false? My neck really hurts. I'll tell you more about that later on Kenzie's Corner. When you talk affordable transportation, one of the car companies that comes to mind immediately is Hyundai. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at the revamped Elantra, a car that is aimed at the very heart of that affordable market. For 2004, Hyundai has nipped and tucked the Elantra. While 15 millimeters longer and five millimeters wider, the biggest difference is found in the front balance, where the under bumper treatment takes some of the weight off the look. Likewise, the jeweled appearance of the headlights and taillights adds a touch of class to the overall look. Beyond that, though, you have to study pretty hard to identify all of the changes. You know, this Elantra comes in at over 18,000 and yet does not have anti-lock brakes. Now, in the past, that probably didn't matter for much because nor did the competition. However, Toyota upped the ante with the Echo hatchback because it does get anti-lock brakes and it costs less than the Elantra. So I think Hyundai needs to rethink this one seriously. The truly sad part is that anti-lock brakes are only offered if you buy the Elantra GT and then equip it with the premium package which bumps the sticker to a lofty $21,225 plus of course freight and tax. It also defies marketing logic that having shelled out this sort of coin, Hyundai then has the temerity to charge another $75.42 for the optional carpeted floor mats. You know, Toyota was lampooned for this sort of nickel and diming in the past. Hyundai deserves no less. You know, considering the Elantra's compact dimensions, there's actually a ton of room in the back seat. There's enough space under the seat for your toes, plenty of leg room, ample headroom, and in fact, there's enough room to accommodate three abreast, at least on a shorter trip anyway. Elantra's 2.0-litre engine dishes out 138 ponies and 136 pounds-feet of torque at 4,500 RPM. While the numbers rank as average, the initial launch is strong and the mid-range is such you're never left wanting. Generally, the engine is also quiet and smooth, with noise becoming an issue only at the top end of the rev range. A 5-speed manual gearbox is standard, a 4-speed electronically controlled automatic with overdrive is an option. While the manual does make the best use of the power and brings appreciably better fuel economy, the ease of operation that comes with the Slash-O-Matic, well, it's worth the $1,000 premium, especially for those that spend a lot of time in traffic. It's also much better at finding the right gear than Hyundai's previous automatics. Inside the Elantra is a pleasant place to spend some time. You get plenty of comfort, good fit and finish, and the materials have a sense of quality. You also get power locks, windows, mirrors, cruise control, and air conditioning. There are, however, two pet peeves. The first one, well, these sun visors look like a job lot from Lada. The second pet peeve has to do when you go to pull away. It's all too easy to select third gear because there's no detent between third and drive. Now, if you do drive in third, you lose the benefits of overdrive, which will mar an otherwise stellar fuel economy. Just remember to make sure you are, in fact, in drive. The Elantra rides on McPherson struts up front, a multi-link design in back, and anti-roll bars at both ends. While the ride comfort is good for a car in this category, the Elantra did display a lot of body roll during the pylon test. Likewise, understeer is never far behind if speed rises above moderately enthusiastic, i.e. something little over pedestrian. All of that said, the highlight is the feel and feedback afforded by the rack and pinion steering. It's positive and brings a quick response to driver input. You know, there's absolutely no question that this vehicle is better than the Elantras that preceded it. The trouble is that the improvements come with an improved price. Quite frankly, $19,000 plus taxes for a car that's not equipped with ABS, well, as far as I'm concerned, it takes a bit of the shine off of Hyundai's affordable Apple.
Time to update our long-term Mazda 6. The 6 was selected as Motoring's Car of the Year for 2003, and after a couple of months and a few thousand kilometers, the Mazda has not given us any reason to regret that decision. Now, our vehicle comes with the V6. The same engine is found in the Ford Taurus, and it's more than adequate. But remember, the four-cylinder is built by Mazda, and if most of your driving is in town, it's the perfect fit. Now, as for the 6, low-end torque is less than extraordinary, but on the highway, it's quiet and plenty of power when passing. Now, one small concern has been the excessive brake dust on the front wheels. Now, recently, Bill commented on it and said it's completely normal, although sometimes it's a sign of aggressive braking habits, which is not the case with us. But despite regular car washes, the dust continues to get denser. So Bill has suggested taking it to the dealer and just have them check it out, although we've had no problem with brake performance. We'll do that and check in in our next update. <laughs> Our Midas Tip of the Week concerns making your vehicle more visible at night. Last night I was out in a multi-lane highway and it was a driving rain, just a terrible night. And I noticed a black vehicle just like this one got up beside me and the side marker, side marker lights were burned out on this vehicle. He got right up beside me and I could barely see that vehicle. It's very important on a dark colored vehicle, or any vehicle for that matter, that all these lights are functioning. Make sure in the front that your vehicle has an amber light visible from the side and in the rear a red light visible from the side. In many cases it may be one of the front or rear lamps that wrap around the side of the car but in any case go out tonight as soon as it's dark turn on your parking lights and make sure that all four of your side marker lights are illuminated. In most cases many owners manuals will give you instructions on how to change these bulbs. It's pretty simple and the bulbs are very inexpensive but it's very important that your vehicle is visible at night. That's your Midas tip of the week. A 36 Chevy 1211 town and country sedan, what it originally started out as, but then it was, it was made into a hot rod in the 50s and then it slowly fell apart, and then it sat in a garage, and it was made into a hot rod again in 69, 70. Then it sat in the garage for 15 years till I bought it, and then re-rotted it again. Then I just went nuts on it. it. turned actually into a piece of artwork. I just started making pieces for it, and kind of got carried away, I think. <laughs> well, I put all four power windows in it, where it's a lot of guys don't bother with the back windows. They'll just make them rigid, the front windows. On the doors, I used uh, Crown Vic motors and made all my own tracks and everything. Did away with the vent windows in the doors. Uh, dropped the roof two inches in it. Uh, the interior in that, that was out of a uh, Chrysler Turbo Laser. And made all the panels, made all the door panels, all the aluminum pieces I cut out and polished and did them all on a bandsaw. Hydraulic front end, I actually bought those pistons out of lawn sale. For, I bought four of them for five dollars and they didn't have a long enough stroke to lift that hood so then I made all that tracking up to add the six inches to the, to the hood to get the hood where I wanted it. It's a 327 small block out of a 69 VET. It's a high performance engine and the transmission is a Saginaw 4 speed out of a Camaro. A lot of nights I'd just stand out in the garage and just design. I never put anything on paper. I just, just built it and envisioned what it was going to look like and made it look that way. I wish I had a time clock. I don't know how much I spent on it. I don't know. Lots of times the wife would say, you're going to bed, it's like 11 o'clock, and I'd look at clock again, it's like 3 in the morning. You get working, making something, and the time flies. You know. So yeah, it kept you really busy for a year and a half. Well, as you can see, Motoring's Car of the Year winner, Graham Jardine, has been unable to wipe that smile off his face as he has his day here at the Shannonville Racetrack, site of the Automobile Journalists Association of Canada's annual test fest as they check out the class of 2004. And as you know, this year, our man in the Quaker State Garage, Bill Gardner, has been reviewing a vehicle he knows a lot about, and that's the pickup truck. In this case, it's the Toyota Tundra. So let's see how that is going and also get Bill's thoughts on what's happening here at the Test Fest. Well, Brad, it must be just dizzying for those automotive journalists getting in and out of so many cars in a short space of time. I think it's really great the way they do their checklists and notes and the fact that they can get right out of one car and into a competitor's car in the same segment right away gives them a real good chance to do a head-to-head -head evaluation. Now on our Tundra, 
We're at 18,500 kilometers on our long-term test. I've had three trips to the States, some pretty long road trips. Two of those involved some serious time in the mountains. And I got as far south as Hilton Head, South Carolina. So I got some real high temperature conditions down there. A couple of days in the mid 90s. And the cooling system and oil pressure on the tundra were absolutely great. Lots of oil pressure even in the mid 90s. Tons of cooling as you can see. Great big cooling area in the front. And that's typical of all full size pickup trucks. Uh, driving through the mountains I found the engine power just fantastic. You could attack those grades at any speed and it would pull high gear all the way up the grades without a downshift, without losing any revs. And that's the nice part about having the muscle of a V8 engine. The neat thing about the Tundra is it's a pretty small displacement V8, 4.7 liters. Most of the competitors have bigger engines, but they don't have any more muscle than this. This engine's a high-tech engine and it makes real good power. Now we, we've done two oil changes on the Tundra already, a couple of oil filters, uh, zero oil consumption up to this point. It's been really good in that respect. In terms of the interior, the ride comfort is really great. I like the seats, the adjustability, ride position, the, the uh, ride position is great. One little pet peeve that I have is the uh, pouches in the doors. Uh, I find them a little bit on the small side and the opening to get your fist in there to retrieve whatever you put in there is a little small. They open up as you get down in there, but getting your fist through in the first place is not all that easy. It's just a small complaint, but I'd really like to see those door pockets much bigger. On my old Chevy, they were almost the full length of the door, much wider and deeper as well. And I lined them with old coffee cups, and I had change in one, tools in another, parts in another, all kinds of odds and ends like tie wraps, etc. And I found when I was doing service calls, they were right at hand as I was getting in and out of the truck, so it was really handy. Be a simple thing for them to address. Next time, the next update on the Tundra, I'm going to tell you something interesting that I found concerning the tire pressure. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2004. <laughs>been around for 20 years, uh, since 1984, and um, they've never been able to really penetrate the Canadian market. Uh, we have now an advantage or an opportunity to um, finally deliver an S281 and an S281 supercharged to the Canadian public through Ford of Canada dealers. Mustang is a great car, it is the pony car. Uh, we've just uh, pushed the envelope and maybe pushed it a little over, but uh, we've pushed the envelope. We were able to pack in a little over 425 horsepower. We revise the complete suspension, 18 inch wheels, Pirelli, P0 tires. Uh, we've uh, added a full air management uh, system, uh, front, rear, uh, side skirts. Um, and then supercharge the car, exhaust, special exhaust, all tuned by ourselves. Uh, we reprogrammed the computer and uh, exclusivity. I mean, this is the car if you want to have something different. And bang for the buck, you know, the Mustang itself has always been uh, the winner in that category. And like I said, we've just pushed that envelope a little farther. On a previous show, I mentioned that the only way long term that we're going to reduce insurance premiums in this country is to reduce the payouts the insurance companies have to make. And one area which has skyrocketed in the last few years is what they call soft tissue injuries. Now this is a medical term for whiplash. Now whiplash, sadly enough, is the perfect malingerer's disease because you can't prove it's there and you can't prove it's not there. If you say you hurt and you can convince your insurance company that you hurt, you got a free ticket. Now I'm not saying that everybody who has whiplash is a fraud or a malingerer because it does hurt. But the fact is the payouts have increased monumentally over the last five to ten years. Part of that's because some provinces allow paralegals to help you negotiate with your insurance companies. And once you got a pro on your side, well then the money starts to roll in. Now the problem with whiplash is that there is a way to prevent it from happening in the first place. Both Volvo and Saab, leaders in car safety, over the last 10 years have invented anti-whiplash seats. The technology is different, but the results are the same. The seat cushions you in the rear end collision, prevents your neck from being snapped forward. Their studies in Sweden show that whiplash is reduced over 70 percent 
with this type of seat. Now Volvo, as a part of the Ford organization, those seats are starting to, to uh, flow into the Ford cars. Saab is part of General Motors, the same thing's happening there. But you know, if our federal government really wanted to step in here and do something positive for car insurance rates, they'd mandate anti-whiplash seats in every car. Maybe if they'd stop worrying about eight kilometer an hour bumpers versus five kilometer an hour bumpers, which don't have any effect on anybody, and mandated this type of seat, maybe we'd reduce our insurance premiums by 70%. Anybody going to vote for that? I'm Jim Kenzie. Well, automotive journalists from across the country are continuing to test out the 2004 models here in Shannonville on this high-speed track. And speaking of this track, an incident happened here a few years back, which I'd like to share with you. It was a year in which Lada decided to enter this competition. And while one of their vehicles was being driven around this high-speed track, the gear shift came off. Now, nobody was hurt with the exception of a Lada's ego. And I should tell you that Lada has not been seen here since. Before we go, I just want to remind you that our Car of the Year special is quickly approaching. We have all our nominees in each segment posted on our webpage. So why don't you cast your vote by logging on to motoringtv.com or you can get to us through tsn.ca. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Well, Brad, it was a wonderful opportunity. You did a great job in introducing me to so many people, and they were so uh, friendly, just you know, made me feel at home and very much like one of the group. It's just been a great experience. It's a shame that uh, not everyone can have the experience, but uh, I'm glad it was me. Um, you know, you say it's a dirty job, but I was glad to do it. And now, it's showtime. The capacity is approximately 450 cars. We average about 250 cars on the weekend nights in the summertime. We have a projection house, certainly, and we have the North America's biggest screen. TSN's Motoring 2004 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care. We do that. <laughs>